as I mentioned earlier, of course, children are exposed to a culture of violence, so violent policies have become normalized for them. Now, you may say, well, the press and television are very quiet about these developments, so why would people be reacting? Well, I say progressive people know how to get into information from the internet. And they also know that they have to be a little critical of what the press offers. So one of the things that people can do, and all of you can do, is to guide people to the news that is hardly reported. Help tell people, if they don't know, how they can get this alternative news on the internet. And I, some of those sources are here, but you can find many of your own. And that is doing something about it. It isn't useless. It may not solve the problem, but if we're quiet, nobody will know that anything is happening at all. Uh, the second thing is fear. Uh, being an outspoken opponent of war or an organizer of anti-war protests can incur pen penalties. Uh, they may range from social ostracism to loss of employment. Even tenured professors can be booted for opposition to U.S. foreign policy. Those with much less job protection have reason to fear. And it is also the case that um, people aren't popular if they go around with the bad news. I, I have thought about this a lot because I'm not very popular at all <laughs> to begin with. <laughs> And, and I tell people things they don't want to hear, and uh, they, they want to avoid it, of course. I can understand that. But I don't know why I do it anyway. I just have an, I'm, I'm impelled to do that. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm self destructive or something. <laughs> um, the other thing, again, stepping on people's toes, liberal religious groups today mostly have declining membership. And they may be concerned about creating stress among their members, among their congregations. They may be concerned about putting off prospective followers if they dissent, if they're known to be <coughs> dissenting. Unfortunately, our, uh, our current minister is, is very outspoken and it's excellent. Uh, any organization may be afraid of displeasing its largest donors. And the largest donors, whether they're foundations or individuals, are people who might very well uh, benefit from war and, and not oppose it. And those are the people with the money, and if you're in an organization, you don't want to be offensive. And there are many ways of doing that. I had a, an issue a number of years ago with a dear friend of mine in this congregation who was a member of the American Association of University Women. And at the time, I looked up, I checked out, I did give a talk to the university women group, but I, I had thought of joining it, and I checked it out and saw that Boeing was a large partner of the AAUW, as well as uh, BAE Systems was also a contributor. And I mentioned this to my dear friend, and I felt very bad about doing it, to say this sort of thing. But it is the case that you know, Boeing was giving uh, you know, scholarships for women to go into science and, you know, the nice things. Now, uh, BAE is part of an organization in New Hampshire to create, get more women to go into science. So you don't want to disturb those, those big donors. There also is <coughs> some threat of government reprisal to individuals and organizations. I, I think cases have been fairly few, but still, there's an atmosphere of repression. Then again, which, which Will alluded to, is that Democratic Party supporters may feel the further loss of congressional seats, they fear the loss of the presidency, and they also, people also, do not want to criticize a biracial president whose election is considered a sign of progress. Some people argue 
that Obama's election destroyed the anti-war movement, and I think there's a lot of truth in that. It's very hard. If you, if you criticize the policies of Obama, they will say, well, you must be a racist. Same way if you criticize the policies of Israel, you're an anti-Semite. And that is something that creates fear in people, and they don't want to be uncomfortable, and they're afraid of being labeled. In fact, another fear that people have is being labeled a conspiracy theorist. And for that reason, a lot of people in my profession, political science, didn't deal with anything except the most superficial uh, evidence of, of government. They never wanted to go behind, many of them, what was reported, what was happening, because, I mean, for example, they wouldn't talk about Bilderberg. You couldn't talk about Bilderberg without being called a conspiracy theorist. But this is a very important organization, and it exists. And you can get the information about it. But many people won't, won't say anything about it if they're respectable academics. I was never that respectable. I mean, I was lucky, really. One of the reasons why I was able to speak out on many issues was because I taught at Keene State College. And that was not an elite institution. And they were happy that I, that anybody published anything. You know, <laughs> and, but also there was not, there was not that pressure to conform as far as political ideology was concerned. There was certainly pressure to conform in other ways that I never could meet, the pressure to give high grades. I never could do that. And uh, so I, I wasn't very popular for that reason. Yeah, but but, but it, it's true in many, many of the state colleges, let's say, or, or even technical institutes, places like that. Professors are freer to speak out and to engage in radical political activity or whatever. If, if, you're, if you're at Yale, you only get credit if you publish in certain refereed journals. And they tend to be very establishment oriented. So I, I published in more radical journals like the, the Monthly Review, Telos. I, I would get no credit for that if I were to. Ivy League institution, and they would say that's not. Um, so, um, yes. Okay. Yeah. One one example of this fear is that um, it's very rare. No, no. Sorry, I got stuck here. 